Hello, this is a talk on a series of papers by Jan van Evan and myself dealing with the veil functional calculus. This will also include some work in progress with my current PhD student Himani Sharma and work of my former PhD student Sean Harris. So the veil functional calculus is a group-based functional calculus, something similar to the Phillips functional calculus, but the Phillips functional calculus is a commutative functional calculus which is based on a group which algebraically is R or RD. Now we're going to deal with a functional calculus which is based on a non-commutative group which algebraically will be the Eisenberg group. And the point of doing that is to have an abstraction of pseudo-differential operators in the same way as commutative functional calculi provide you with a way to, in an operator theoretic manner, generalize the Fourier multipliers on RD. Let me start by reminding you what these concrete functional calculi that we are trying to generalize are. So let's start with Fourier multipliers. Well, a Fourier multiplier is, as the name implies, a operator where you take the Fourier transform of a function u in L2 and multiply it by something, then takes the inverse Fourier transform. So as long as you're multiplying by a symbol that is in L infinity, you will define through this, a bounded linear operator on L2. That's a consequence of the fact that the Fourier transform is an isometry. More generally speaking, you can discuss when this operator is bounded on LP spaces for different values of P, and that will require some smoothness and decay information on the symbol F. Now, generally speaking, in harmonic analysis, one can look at pseudo-differential operators. So operators where you take the Fourier transform, multiply it by a function, not just of the momentum variable xi, but also of the position variable x, and then take the inverse for a transform. So you have a lot of results describing boundedness of these operators on various function spaces. And here is one, it's due to Amanda. It tells you that if this condition is satisfy, this condition on the right hand side, we say that A is in the symbol class S0, then TA will be a bounded linear operator on LP for P strictly between one and infinity. So what we have here is a condition that involves smoothness, of the symbol A and an appropriate decay in the momentum variable. And this is what we're trying to generalize in this talk. Now, let me give you a little bit of motivation. Why do we want to do this? We want to do this because we want to be able to do harmonic analysis in situations where the Fourier transform is not available or not particularly relevant. We want to be able to do harmonic analysis that is adapted to the spectral theory of certain differential operators typically that arise in applications. So example of that, Partial differential equations, even on RD, if you're looking at a PDE problem where the coefficients are far from being constant, it may not be the best idea to use Fourier transform-based tools because they are directly tied up with the spectral theory of the constant coefficient differential operators. So if your differential operators is too far away from that, you would be better off starting your harmonic analysis in a way that's adapted to that operator. Other example, you work on Lie groups. If the Lie group is not locally compact and abelian, you don't have a good duality theory allowing you to, to use a Fourier transform. Third example, non-commutative LP spaces and analysis on those spaces. Recently, there's been some beautiful harmonic analysis developed in the context of what are called the quantum Euclidean spaces of non-commutative geometry. This is work of Marius Junger, Javier Passet, and their collaborators in particular. So when you want to do harmonic analysis in that context, again, operator theory comes and help you replace uh, Fourier transform-based tools. And then last but not least, uh, a set of examples that Jan von Erwin and I are very much interested in are uh, examples coming from stochastic analysis, Mariana calculus in particular, and from mathematical physics around what are called einstein uhlenbeck operators. So for all of the things, we have harmonic analysis that look like a Fourier multiplier theory, but in many cases, we're lacking something that looks like a pseudo-differential operator theory. And that's what we're trying to develop. So how do we generalize Fourier multipliers? Well, at a very high level of generality, what we can do is define a functional calculus for symbols that are particularly smooth. So symbols that have a bounded holomorphic extension to a sector of the complex plane that is called the H infinity functional calculus. So in that context, you have sectorial operators, that is to say operators that have their spectrum in a sector of the complex plane and outside of a slightly bigger sector they satisfy a uniform resolvent estimate of this kind and then if you have a function psi that is bounded holomorphic but also integrable in an appropriate manner that is to say integrable against the measure d lambda over lambda 
on the boundary of the spectrum. That's the H1 condition. And gamma here is a contour that goes along the boundary of a slightly bigger sector. Then this integral here is convergent and the strong operator topology, absolutely. And this defines a bounded linear operator. Now, once you've defined such a functional calculus, you should ask yourself, does it actually extend to a continuous algebra homomorphism from the algebra of functions H infinity, bounded holomorphic on the sector, to the algebra of bounded linear operators in X? Now, that may or may not happen. This depends on the operator and on the Banach space X. And so we are going to have a definition that says that an operator has an HVD calculus, or more precisely, a bounded HVD functional calculus, whenever for this operators f of l that are well defined when f is in h1, we have a uniform estimate here in terms of the supnorm of f, not the h1 norm of f. And this is a good definition because as soon as you have these estimates, you can indeed extend your functional calculus from the class of function h1 to the full class of function h infinity. There's many ways to do that. One is the convergence lemma. When you have an operator with an HV functional calculus, you take a function f in h infinity, you can approximate it with elements in h1 and the pointwise convergence of fn to f, as long as the sequence fn is bounded in h infinity, will imply the strong operator topology convergence of the sequence of operators f and l, and they will converge to a bounded linear operator that you will call f of l, and you can show that this is independent of the approximating sequence that you choose. Now, in applications, having a functional calculus for holomorphic functions is sometimes not enough. Sometimes you really want to be able to restrict your attention to part of the spectrum of L, project on this part of the spectrum. And in order to do that, you need functions in your functional calculus that are compactly supported. Now, results that allow you to extend from the HV functional calculus to a larger class of function that includes compactly supported one, this is called a spectral multiplier theorem. There are plenty of them that you can find in the literature. I want to mention one abstract result of this nature due to Kriegler and Weiss in 2018, because I'm going to use this result later in the talk, and this is very much in the spirit of what we're trying to do here. So this result tells you that if you have an operator L and you already know it has a bounding HFE functional calculus and you do that on sectors of arbitrary small angle, then if you have an extra bit of information, a very precise quantified information on the boundedness of the semi-group generated by L in complex time, then you can extend the calculus to something called an Ermenda class, so something very closely related to the S0 class of symbol that I was mentioning earlier, and certainly contains some compactly supported function that would allow you to have some proper spectral projections. Now we want to design a similar functional calculus approach to pseudo-differential operators. So how do we do that? Well, earlier we thought about the operator L as a generalization of the Laplacian. What we need to do now is think about generalization of the partial derivatives and generalization of the operators of multiplication by a coordinate xj. So this will look like this. You're in a Banach space and you look at group generators. The first group generators correspond to the translation group on RD, and the second family of group generators correspond to the group of multiplication by e to the i x j. So how do we abstract their properties? Well, we want each one of them to generate a bounded groups on our Banach space, and then we want commutation relation, canonical commutation relation. So we want all of the groups generated by the PJs to commute with each other, all of the groups generated by the QJs to commute with each other, the group generated by a PJ to commute with the group generated generated by a QK whenever J is not equal to K. And when J is equal to K, then we want this commutation relation, namely that you pick up an extra factor here coming from the fact that the commutator between P and Q has to be the identity, or if you want coming from the formula that you could prove on RD with the concrete expression of the translation group and the multiplication group. Now, using these groups, we can define a kind of Phillips functional calculus using a type of inversion of a Fourier transform formula. So this is the definition. And the difficulty in making this definition is to choose which non-commutative group generated by both the PJs and the QJs we put here. This particular choice is algebraically meaningful. It comes from the Schrodinger representation of the Eisenberg group as bounded operator on L2 of Rd. And this is relevant because it's going to give the functional calculus good algebraic properties, but also because if these operators q1 to qds are indeed the standard 
position operators, multiplication by xj, and these are the standard momentum operators, that is to say the partial derivative, then we know that any pseudo differential operators on RD can be rewritten in this particular way for an appropriate choice of A. Now, of course, this is only meaningful for now when a hat is in L1. So let's say this is initially defined for symbols A in the Schwarz class. Now, the non commutativity of the functional calculus works like this. When you multiply A of QP by B of QP, you get A moyle product B of QP. And what is the moyle product? Well, it is defined in the following way. If you take the Fourier transform of A moyle product B, you get the twisted convolution of the Fourier transform of A with the Fourier transform of B. And the twist in the convolution is this factor here that twist the 2D variables with each other. Now, if you are familiar with the differential operator theory, of course, you know the Moyle product as the product that appears when you try to compose pseudo differential operators, compose their symbols. So this is perfectly consistent with what we're trying to generalize. Now, at this stage, I can't resist the urge of making a little digression and telling you that Joe Moyle, who gave his name to the Moyle product mentioned earlier, was an Australian mathematician and one of the first professors at my institution, the Australian National University, and that Alan McIntosh, who to a large extent was the creator of the HFD functional calculus, was also an Australian mathematician working at the ANU. And Alan and Joe Moyle were good friends, but they sort of their mathematics is quite separate. And when Jan von Evan and I started developing this kind of H infinity functional calculus perspective on the Veil functional calculus, Alan was quite happy with that because it connected his mathematics to the mathematics of his old friend, uh, Joe Moyle. But maybe beyond this uh, nice sort of personal aspects of it, uh, there's something philosophical about it that's quite interesting. What Alan wanted to do was really develop a functional calculus, you know, have functions of operators and use that to solve problems that involve those operators. Whereas what Joe Moyal was trying to do was kind of the opposite. He wanted to have a function theoretic perspective on the Eisenberg formalism of quantum mechanics. So instead of working with operators and have the uncertainty principle encode in their non-commutativity properties, have the non-commutativity property shifted to a product on a space of functions over phase space. Now, of course, this is a two-way street and what we're doing here is going back and forth between the function theoretic perspective and the operator theoretic perspective. So what does the theory look like? Well, just like with the HVD functional calculus, we define a notion of having a bounded S not veiled calculus by saying that we want the operators AQP defines for A in the Schwarz class to satisfy some uniform estimates depending only on the seminorms that define the S not topology. And we want to control finitely many of these seminorms for some number M that's typically is just some function of the dimension and independent of A. And then the difficulty, of course, is to show that once you have this type of estimates for symbols A in the Schwarz class, you can extend your functional calculus to the entire class S0 of symbol. And this is done through a convergence lemma. You show that if you have convergence uniformly on compact sets of all the partial derivatives of your AN up to potentially just a finite order, then you have convergence in the strong operator topologies of the resulting operators. Note that this is a little harder to prove than in the commutative situation because when you approximate a symbol A by symbols in the Schwarz class, you are going to use some multiplications and these multiplications of functions won't be turned into multiplication of operators. So you're going to need to compare the multiplication to the Moyle multiplication and estimate the corresponding error terms. Nevertheless, it works, and all we have to do in practice is prove this estimates for A in the Schwarz class. But how do you do that? Well, a very convenient tool to do it is a transference result that we prove in our main paper with Jan. And this transference result transfer the boundedness of the operator AQP to the boundedness of a twisted convolution operator on the Bogner space LP with value in X. Now, the problem is, we have lots of good theorems to decide whether or not a convolution operator is bounded in a Buckner space. But here we don't have a convolution operator, we have a twisted convolution. And the harmonic analysis theory of twisted convolution with value in a Banach space is at the moment completely underdeveloped. Nevertheless, in some situations when the Banach space X is itself an LP space, then we can use some extrapolation techniques to estimate this kind of norms.
Now, in general, computing the norms of these twisted convolution operators is very difficult, but it can be perfectly fine for specific symbols. And one family of symbols that we are particularly interested in is this family right here, defined by this expression. It is for the Moyle product, the analog of the exponential function for the standard pointwise product in the sense that this family indexed by a parameter t real satisfy this type of Cauchy equation for the Moyle product. Here I have the family indexed by a parameter z that I think of as being an element of a sector of the complex plane. And using that, one can prove that az of qp is indeed a C0 semi-group on our Banach space, and we can identify the generator as being this abstract harmonic oscillator. And I call it an abstract harmonic oscillator, of course, because in the classical case where x is LP of rd, and these are momentum and position operator, then what we would have here is really the Laplacian minus the multiplication by length of x squared. Now, algebraically, as a function of z, these symbols are not particularly nice, but analytically, they are very nice, because if you look at the Fourier transform, you get something like this, or at least that you can estimate by an expression of this form, that is to say something that looks very much like the standard heat kernel. So the idea is that when working with the Moyle product and when working in this non-commutative functional calculus, rather than working directly with this semi-group, we will deal analytically with a convolution operator that look very much much like a standard heat semi-group. Now using that, if we are in an LP space, or in fact more generally in a UMD Banach lattice, we can check these conditions. So we can prove an abundance property of the semi-group in complex time with a very precise estimate on the dependency on the angle. And that is exactly the conditions that appear in the krieglov theorem that I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk. Now, if we really are in an LP space, it's easy to prove that L as an HFD functional calculus on L2. And then we can extrapolate that using a result of Kunzmann and Ullmann from 2015 that allowed us to extrapolate the HFD functional calculus from L2 to LP using of diagonal bounds on the semi-group. And here we prove the of diagonal bounds on the semi-group using the concrete expression of the kernel of this operator az of qp. So that works when the underlying space of variable is a doubling metric measure space in the proof of Kunzmann and Ullmann. And then having an HV functional calculus on LP plus these conditions allow us to apply the krieglov weiss theorem and get a Hermenda calculus on LP. So any operator that looks algebraically like the harmonic oscillator is the sum of a p squared plus a q squared, where the p's in the q generates groups and satisfy canonical commutation relation, will always have an h infinity and in fact a Hermenda calculus on LP spaces, p to one infinity of course, over any doubling metric measure space. Now this idea of using a functional calculus which is algebraically more appropriate is not limited to operators that act on LP spaces over doubling metric measure spaces. And here is a good example, the Einstein-Rembeck operator. So in this context, we work on LP over RD, but with the Gaussian measure instead of the Lebesgue measure. And here are our position and momentum operators. The position operator doesn't change, but the momentum operator changes from being the partial derivative to being this operator here, which involves both differentiation and multiplication. And the corresponding harmonic oscillator is a famous operator called the Einstein-Rembeck operator, which is like Laplacian minus x times gradient. Now, the challenges in this situation are the following. Well, first of all, the underlying space is not a doubling metric measure space. That's because the Gaussian measure is not doubling. And even more problematically for our theory, the operators PJs do not generate bounded group if p is not equal to 2. Nevertheless, there is a real advantage in looking at the Einstein-Rembeck semi-group through the veil calculus of disposition and momentum operators initially defined on L2. So when you look at this operator and you introduce this isometry up to move between the Gaussian measure and uh, Lebesgue measure, you get an integral operator with an integral kernel that has a much nicer expression than the standard expression you get from looking at L directly. And in particular, what you get are estimates of this kernel that look very much like standard heat kernel estimates, which means that the analysis of these operators boil down to fairly basic harmonic analytic techniques. Indeed, you can use that to prove our sectoriality of the semi-group with the optimal angle. You get the optimal angle basically by studying this expression here. This is a result of Sean Harris, and this gives to abstract h infinity functional calculus theory, h infinity functional calculus with optimal angle. Now, this is quite striking because Sean 
is able to do that in just a couple of pages thanks to this expression coming out of the veil calculus where has the original proof back in 2001 from Garcia Cueva, Mocheri, Meda, Shugan, and Torea takes roughly 40 pages of kernel computation. So the analysis gets substantially simpler once you look at things from the point of view of the appropriate algebra. Things that uh, Jan and I did too is recover all sorts of optimal LPLQ mapping properties in that way. Once again, the analysis boils down purely to uh, sure estimates. Also, interestingly enough, this kind of explains why you have some intriguing regions of analyticity for the uh, extension to the complex plane of the einstein ullenbeck semi group. What happens is that through this change of time variable, z goes to lambda z, this intriguing region called the person region gets turned into a genuine sector with this optimal angle. So the algebra just really forces you to look at time through this change of variable. And when you look at it this way, the analysis becomes so much simpler. So the message here is that when you use operator theory to bring harmonic analytic techniques to a new settings, you have more than one way to do so. For instance, if you think of a harmonic oscillator, you can think of it as a single operator and use a one variable functional calculus to study it. Or you can remember that it comes from a tuple of non-commuting operators and use a non-commutative functional calculus that captures the algebraic properties of that tuple in order to study it. Now what we've seen is that the latter brings in some simplification. It makes the hard analysis, the harmonic analytic estimates much easier to prove. And I think there's a general principle there that can be applied. Now, where is the theory going? Well, at the moment, Himani Sharma is looking at applications to quantum Euclidean spaces. This is a setting of non-commutative LP spaces in which harmonic analysis is currently being developed and there has been some amazing advances in the last few years. And it looks like our functional calculus approach is simplifying some of these results and we wanna see how far that goes. Beyond that, we also wanna look at applications to harmonic analysis on Lie groups. But in order to do so, we're going to need to overcome one limitation of our approach. And the limitation is that, well, we've moved from having a Phillips type functional calculus based on a commutative group to moving, having a functional calculus based on the Eisenberg group. But the Eisenberg group is just one choice of Lie group and we could use all sorts of other choices and we will need to be able to use other Lie groups that the Eisenberg groups to be really relevant in a range of applications. So this is one of the things we need to do next. And if you're interested, come and join us. Thanks a lot for your attention.